seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half. What is the single greatest achievement of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration? Is it this? Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Putting boots on the surface of the moon? That is a very memorable one. Many people, when they think of NASA, still think of the Space Shuttle, 135 flights aboard the first reusable orbiters, landing on runways instead of in the ocean. Others will think of crafts millions of miles away and operating to this day, like the Voyager probes or the Mars rovers. However, there are many at the agency, as well as myself, who believe that NASA's finest hour began on April 11th and ended on April 17th, 1970. More specifically, it began on day two of the Apollo 13 mission, when first Jack Swigert and then James Lovell said, Houston, we've had a problem here. Apollo 13 was to be the third mission to land on the moon, and would have been the second to demonstrate the lunar lander's ability to perform precision landings at specific lunar sites. More so than the previous two, Apollo 13's to-do list had far more science involved, specifically geology, emphasized by the mission's motto, Ex Luna Scientia, From the Moon, Knowledge. The mission was commanded by James Lovell, 42 at the time, and the only crew member to have already flown in space twice in the Gemini program, as well as on Apollo 8. Fred Hayes was to pilot the lunar module Aquarius and was 35. Though he had never flown in space, he had served as backup pilot for both Apollo 8 and 11. Piloting the command module Odyssey was Jack Swigert, 38, who had actually been a late replacement for Ken Mattingly after Mattingly was grounded for exposure to rubella. Swigert had specifically trained to be a command module pilot and was a member of Apollo 7's astronaut support crew. Apollo 13's launch occurred at 2.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on April 11, 1970, right on time. The flight of its first stage proceeded nominally, separated along with the interstage, and the second stage ignited. However, about two minutes before she was supposed to, the center second stage engine shut down. Staging flight. Roger. Flight fighter trajectory confirmed staging. Roger. Flight booster then board out was way early. Okay. This was caused by pogo oscillation, essentially a vibration in the rocket caused by unstable combustion cycles, and the vehicle's guidance system shut down the engine responsible to counter it. Interestingly enough, a fix for these oscillations had actually already been worked out, but the Apollo program was on a time crunch, and didn't have time to implement it on Apollo 13. To compensate for the early shutdown, the remaining four engines as well as the third stage fired for longer to complete orbital insertion. Two hours after reaching their parking orbit, the third stage fired up again to put the crew in a course to the moon. Following this, Jack Swigert performed the separation and docking of the CSM Odyssey to the LM Aquarius. Another burn was made using Odyssey's service propulsion system, placing the craft on a hybrid trajectory, departing from a free return trajectory. What this means is very important. On a free return trajectory, a spacecraft will swing back around to the Earth if no other course adjustments are made. However, on this hybrid trajectory, performed to allow for a moon landing at higher latitudes, the spacecraft will swing back around and miss the Earth entirely. On day three of the mission, the consequences of this hybrid trajectory would become realized. Okay, 13, we got uh, Fredo on TV. Uh, Roger, Houston. What we plan to do for you today is turn out in the uh, spaceship or uh, Odyssey 
and take you on through from Odyssey uh, into the tunnel into Aquarius and show you a little bit of uh, the landing uh, vehicle. After the hybrid trajectory burn was complete, the crew settled in for their three-day trip to the moon. Jack Swigert briefly brought up everyone's spirits when he reported that, in the rush he had training to be on the crew, he had forgotten to file his taxes, which would be due while he was on the mission. After everyone laughed about it for a little while, Swigert was found to be entitled to a 60-day extension for being out of the country at the time of the deadline. At hour 55, the crew entered the Aquarius Lunar Module for the first time to check and test its systems. They were recording the event for a television broadcast, which Marilyn Lovell watched from the VIP room at Mission Control because not a single television network decided to air the broadcast. Can you imagine? After only two landings, the American public at large was already bored of landing on the moon. This little tape recorder has been a big benefit to us in passing through the time away on our transit out to the moon. And it's uh, rather odd to see it floating like this in, uh, in Odyssey while it's playing uh, the same from 2001. This is the crew of Apollo 13, which everybody there, a uh, nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Six and a half minutes later, about 56 hours into the mission, Apollo 13 was about 180,000 nautical miles from the Earth. Hayes was shutting down the lunar module after testing, and Lovell was stowing away the TV camera. While they did this, Swigert was being given some minor and seemingly inconsequential requests from Mission Control. One of these requests was to stir the oxygen tanks. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay, stand by. A pressure sensor in one of the service module's oxygen tanks had appeared to be malfunctioning. This was not unheard of. Over time, the contents of the tank would stratify into various layers, messing with the equipment's ability to read the contents. Turning on stirring fans inside the tanks would eliminate this problem, and was a common fix for unusual pressure readings, in addition to being a daily task for the crew. So, upon request, Swigert flipped the switches to activate the fans, not knowing that this would be the last normal task performed on Apollo 13. 95 seconds passed. Let's back up. What exactly happened? Oxygen Tank 2 inside the Apollo 13 service module was manufactured by the Beach Aircraft Company in Boulder, Colorado, subcontracted by North American Rockwell. Once brought to Rockwell's facility, the tank was originally installed in the Apollo 10 service module, it was removed to fix an electromagnetic interference problem and replaced with another for the Apollo 10 mission. While Tank 2 was being fixed, it was accidentally dropped about 5 centimeters, which may have further loosened an already faulty fill line assembly. Some of the Teflon insulated wires to the stirring fan system were damaged, and this created a spark when the fans were activated. The resulting fire increased the pressure inside the tank until it ruptured, filling the fuel cell bay with rapidly expanding gas and combustion products. The pressure pushed off an entire panel of the service module, something that wouldn't actually be seen until shortly before the end of the mission. An explosion. The crew heard what they described as a, quote, pretty large bang, and the power began to fluctuate while the attitude control thrusters fired to counter a sudden motion. After 26 seconds of the crew trying to figure out what had happened, the transmission was made that would become an icon in American culture. Okay, uh, uh, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus underbolt. 
Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. In the minutes after the accident, possibilities were eliminated one by one. At first, Lovell thought that Hayes activated the lunar module's repressurization valve, which produced a loud bang, and Hayes occasionally used this to startle the others. However, Hayes wasn't at the controls and didn't know what had happened. Swagger wondered if they had been struck by a micrometeoroid, but he and Lovell could find no evidence of a leak from any impact. The main B-bus undervolt they referred to in the communication meant that the service module's three fuel cells, powered by hydrogen and oxygen from their respective tanks, wasn't producing enough power to the service module's electrical distribution systems. Soon, bus A was also short on voltage, and Hayes checked the status of the fuel cells and found that two out of the three were dead. As the service module's oxygen tanks were slowly reading a loss of pressure, Lovell looked out the window, seeing what he described as a gas of some sort venting into space. The crew now realized the severity of their situation. The mission rules forbade entering lunar orbit unless all three fuel cells were operational. Apollo 13 had lost the moon. The goal of the mission had now abruptly changed. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. Is there any uh, kind of leads we can give them? Are we looking at instrumentation? Or we got real problems? Back at mission control, everyone was focusing. Since tank 2 was gone, the CSM would be drawing on tank 1 to produce oxygen and power systems. Once tank 1 was dry, the remaining fuel cell would shut down. Then the CSM's only sources of power would be batteries and an oxygen surge tank. These final power sources would be critical for the final hours of the mission, and it could already be seen that the remaining fuel cell was already drawing from the surge tank. Tank 1 was also put out of commission by the explosion, meaning the CSM was almost completely out of power. Realizing the problem, Flight Director Gene Krantz ordered the surge tank to be isolated, saving its oxygen, but also ensuring the remaining fuel cell would power down within two hours. A sense of severity was overtaking the room as it was announced that the goal of Apollo 13 had officially changed. Landing on the moon was completely out of the question, the goal was now to simply get the crew home safe. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, to I wonder if we can get back home again. Okay, come, I'm coming back to you. Flight. Go ahead. I think the best thing we can do right now is try to power down. The first problem to be dealt with was power conservation. The Aquarius lunar module had charged batteries and intact full oxygen tanks for use on the surface of the moon. Kranz decided to use the lifeboat method, something that had been anticipated but considered highly unlikely. The astronauts were ordered to power up Aquarius and get on board. It may be worth noting that, if this accident had occurred during Apollo 13's return to Earth, the astronauts likely would have died without the oxygen aboard Aquarius. The next issue was the return path to Earth. Remember that hybrid trajectory I mentioned? On its current flight path, without any adjustment, Apollo 13 was going to pass the Earth entirely on its return. The first consideration was a direct abort, which would use the service propulsion system to execute a burn to bring the craft back before it even flies by the moon. However, since they were unable to directly observe the damage, the question of the state of the service module's engine was an important one. Not only was it unknown if the engine even worked, but there was concern that firing it up could cause further complications with the service module. Aside from this, using this direct abort method would require the CM's fuel cells to last for another hour, and it wasn't known if this was possible. Instead, Kranz made the decision to allow Apollo 13 to first loop around the moon and then execute a return burn to Earth. With the status of the service propulsion system being unknown, attention was turned to the other functional engine aboard the spacecraft, the lunar module's descent engine. Obviously intended to slow Aquarius during its descent to the lunar surface, the LM's engine wasn't as powerful as the service propulsion system, but it could theoretically do the job. The real issue was doing the math. Currently, all calculations in flight software use the presumption that the service propulsion system would be used, so everything needed to be rewritten for the thrust and burn times of the LM engine. Jim Lovell did some of the calculations on the fly himself, and relayed them via the radio to mission control so they could be double-checked. At the same time, mission control technicians were rewriting all of the flight software to allow for the CM-LM combo to make burns from the lunar module, something that had never been anticipated. While much of this complicated math was being done, the Apollo 13 spacecraft reached its perigee around the moon, at an altitude from Earth of 400,171 kilometers, making it the furthest human beings have ever been away from our planet. Shortly before the burn with the lunar module was to be executed, the crew received word from Mission Control that the third stage of the Saturn V, the S-4B, had impacted the surface of the moon 
as it was intended to. This led Jim Lovell to quip, well, at least something worked on this flight. A new problem arose as the crew attempted to orient the spacecraft for the return burn. Normally, they would check their alignment using the position of the stars as seen through the window. However, when the oxygen tank had blown, tiny particles of ice and spacecraft debris surrounded the area, sunlight glinting off of them. Their view would have essentially looked like this. The solution they found, in retrospect, seems obvious. There was one star that was easily recognizable for what it was, no matter the conditions. The sun. This was combined with the fact that, if the crew centered the moon in the window when they made the burn, they would be pointed at exactly where they needed to be. And, uh, mark it, one minute. Roger, Fred. Engine arm to descent. Ignition. Thrust looks good. Shut down. 470. Roger, we copy 7.4. The burn lasted for 4 minutes and 28 seconds and was a complete success. The crew had managed to execute the maneuver with extreme accuracy, within less than 1 foot per second of what it was supposed to be. For reference, I can't do a burn in Kerbal that good when everything is working. The crew was now officially on their way home, and the majority of the module systems were shut down to conserve power. The crew settled in for a chilly and anxious journey. Another problem. The lunar module carried enough oxygen to support the crew, but the carbon dioxide being expelled was meant to be absorbed by canisters of lithium hydroxide pellets. This stock of canisters was meant to be enough to accommodate two astronauts for 45 hours during their time on the moon. However, it would not be enough to accommodate three astronauts for almost three days. The command module had enough canisters, however, the two didn't work together, being of different shapes and sizes. Engineers on the ground considered the problem, bringing the two devices into a room as well as an example of the equipment available to the astronauts, and started improvising. Cut off the outer bag of a liquid cooling garment and retrieve the inner bag. Make belts out of duct tape. Secure them with more tape. Build an arch out of a plastic cue card. Stop up one of the holes with a piece of ripped up towel. A few steps later, and you have the device that NASA engineers effectively referred to as the mailbox. With enough pressure put on them, they had managed to quite literally make a square peg fit into a round hole. Instructions to build the device was read to the crew by mission control over the course of an hour, assembled by Hayes and Swigert. It worked. Carbon dioxide levels began dropping immediately. The crew was safe again, for now. So you see that uh, survival uh, uh, now became one of, uh, of initiative and ingenuity, and, and it was one which the ground continually helped us uh, for. We had all kinds of people on the ground trying to think of ways of, of extending our lifetime. The lunar module had no system to produce water. That was all kept on the command module. As a result, rationing of what water could be gathered was done very carefully about 0.2 liters per crew member a day. By the end of the flight, they collectively lost about 31 pounds, and Hayes developed a urinary tract infection likely caused by his reduced water intake. Inside the dark and low-powered lunar module, the temperature dropped to around 3 degrees Celsius, or 38 Fahrenheit. Swigert had gotten his feet wet while he was filling the water bags. Since he hadn't been scheduled to walk on the moon, he had no overshoes. Not wanting to disturb their careful trajectory, they couldn't discharge their waste into space, it was instead stored in bags around them. Water condensed on the walls. Throughout it all, the crew voiced very few complaints. They were just calmly waiting to get home. Hour 137. After two more correction burns on their way back to Earth, the command module was powered up, and the service module was finally jettisoned away from the spacecraft, allowing the crew to get their very first look at the damage and photograph it. 
We copied that report uh, from Jim Lovell of service module separation at uh, 138 hours, uh, 2 minutes, 8 seconds. And there's one all side of that street there in Pittman. Is that right? Right by the high gate antenna, the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, stage to the uh, engine. Afterwards, the lunar module was jettisoned just before atmospheric re-entry, allowing it to burn up a safe distance away from the command module. After six hair-raising minutes, longer than usual due to the spacecraft's shallow re-entry path, Odyssey regained radio contact, and the crew prepared for a very standard splashdown. The crew, though fatigued, was perfectly fine, save for Hayes' unfortunate infection. At this point, most recollections of the Apollo 13 mission would be talking about the media reaction, how the daring rescue of three astronauts from a failed spacecraft revitalized public interest in the Apollo program. However, quite frankly, I don't want to talk about that. It upsets me that it took three people nearly dying in space to bring eyes back to the greatest achievement of mankind at that time. Successful missions alone should have kept everyone's attention. What Apollo 13 represents to me is what we can achieve when we absolutely have to. The teamwork of everyone on the ground who had to rewrite software from scratch, do math that I can't even comprehend, and come up with engineering solutions that only a small percentage of the human population could ever come up with. The tenacity and professionalism of the astronauts themselves, isolating the issues and implementing the solutions with perfect precision. They were such exemplary astronauts that Ron Howard had to invent drama between them in order to make his movie more compelling. You don't tell me how to fly the damn CM, all right? You don't they brought me know, in here to do, do a job, they asked me to stir the damn tanks, and I stirred the tanks! Apollo 13 showed the world what NASA was really capable of, and unfortunately, it feels like much of that potential has been leached away over the years. I pray this new space race will bring us back to that era of NASA. Back to the days when failure was not an option. I recall, Captain, that when I spoke to you on the phone, you said that you regretted that you were unable to complete your mission. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.